episode of the Rose and Rubini podcast, Making Sense of This World. Uh, again, very excited for the first time to be uh, joining you in person, Brunello. Uh, this week, we'll be revisiting an idea that you've shared quite a few times before, this idea of theorizing of European integration in concentric circles. But I want to start a bit broader than that, because you start off this week's newsletter talking about uh, the two camps that are emerging uh, in the world right now and how the Russia-Ukraine war might be motivating the existence of these camps. So tell me more about what those two sides look like. Yeah, we have discussed quite a few times that uh, the world has been polarized by the war. There was already an ongoing Cold War II, the way it was called, between US and China. The first one was, of course, between the US and Soviet Union. Um, but there were some actors that were a bit undecided which, which, uh, which way to go. One was, of course, the EU. The other was uh, Russia and to some extent India. Now, with the war in Ukraine, it is kind of clear that Russia has decided to side with China and uh, the EU has to go back to the traditional Atlantic alliance, somehow forcefully in the sense that they've been trying to become autonomous, slightly more independent, also from a geostrategic ge perspective, but somehow they're not been extremely successful in the last uh, a uh, few decades. So they had to return from um, where they <laughs> come. Um, India remains the big unknown. To some extent, they have been uh, 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 going more towards the US recently and against China. Uh, but traditionally, they've been pro Russia, or in any case, they sided with the Soviet Union during Cold War I. So they are still in the middle. Our hunch is that eventually they will side with the US and the Western Alliance, so to speak, but they haven't shown any sign of doing so just yet. So it remains an unknown and something that needs to be watched in coming years. Interesting. And I know we'll revisit that model because, again, you shared this uh, quite a few years ago, uh, but now it's become particularly more relevant, I'd say, in the context of what's going on now. So tell me, how, in what way should we theorize of European integration in concentric circles? Yeah, so um, for the time being, we have seen uh, various ideas of European integration. The first one has been everybody going ahead at the same time, which remains the prevailing idea. Somebody has spoken about the two-speed U, whereby one side uh, integrates further and faster and the others are a bit slower. And to some extent, the idea that there is a Eurozone within the EU shows that somebody had wanted to go towards the monetary and um, integration before others. For example, Sweden is part of the EU, but it's not part of the Eurozone. At the same time, uh, this idea of two speeds uh, uh, not work in other areas such as defense or uh, fiscal policy or others. I mean, uh, eventually think about the UK left the EU because uh, the UK thought that eventually we'll have to go, um, in, uh, we'll have to reach the same level of integration of the other countries. The idea of concentric circle is that the destination of travel is different. It's not just a question of speed. Some countries will remain fully and totally integrated and they constitute the Eurozone, which might accept new members or may lose at some point, perhaps. Mm some members that thought that they might think be thinking that the eurozone is a bit of a straight jacket um but that would remain the real core of 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 the eu in which you have integrated monetary and fiscal policies eventually or regulations and and then even uh, uh, the political agenda to some extent a wider circle would be the current eu which might have new members and might lose again some members, as he lost the UK uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and that would be uh, an area in which all the things that are done at your level will, will remain. Um, and, uh, but definitely those countries uh, would not want to join the Euro area, so to speak, with the further in integration that we have spoken. And then there would be an outer circle that we can call uh, European common space or call it as you want, somebody call it European confederation. It really doesn't matter the way you call it. It's an outer circle in which you have countries uh, that uh, uh, do not want 
or cannot join the EU. For example, Ukraine that would be somehow forbidden to join the EU by uh, Russia, either peacefully or forcefully. Um, but at some point, they want to have some form of very strong association uh, with, uh, with the EU. And other countries, we may speak about that later, may be following the same uh, example. Hmm. And I mean, slightly related to this, you circulated another idea uh, in your newsletter, the idea, if I understand it correctly, that if sovereignty goes up, then power needs to go down to sort of keep out populist forces. Tell me a bit more about that. Yeah, I mean, uh, of course, the more you integrate, the more you're passing sovereign upstairs, so to speak, um, from your municipal level to regional level to regional level, from regional level to uh, country level, from country level to supranational level, so being the ECD, being the European Commission, being, you know, all other supranational uh, authorities could be the uh, cyber crime or uh, cyber security agency or any other federal, so to speak, um, agency. So as sovereignty goes up, people feel deprived of their control over what's going on in the country. Uh, and in order to avoid that, you need to somehow show that power is in fact going down more towards people, exactly to avoid the situation that we uh, saw in the UK, whereby people thought, oh my goodness, all the key decisions are made in Brussels. What, what is London for? What am I deciding here in Manchester, in the Midlands or wherever mm -hmm. it happens? So I want to have a real power. I wanna really make decisions. I wanna be at the center of attention. So clearly that means that some control power, for example, not, needs to be devolved downwards, so to speak, as sovereignty goes upwards. And an example could be if then countries become part of a wider union, think about the Eurozone that we discussed before, where most of uh, sovereignty is at, at the point at federal level rather than national level, well then at that point internal borders become much less relevant. Unfortunately, the, the refugee crisis and then the pandemic has shown that borders are very much still there, right? But in theory, in a world in which there's the free circulation of people and goods and services and capital and so on, the four freedoms that people discuss about the EU or in this, certainly the Eurozone, then the idea that the national border exists between say Northern uh, Italy and Austria or, or um, uh, the uh, East of France and the West of Germany or between uh, the South of France and the North of Spain, you know, those borders make not much sense because there are macro regions in practice that share say, say issues much more in common than some of those regions uh, have with other regions of the same nation, but on the other side of the country, say Piedmont and Sicily, uh, or um, in France, uh, the two sides, the East and the West, and same in Germany and so forth and so forth. That means that you could create cross-border macro regions that become the center of, the real center of power, devolve powers downwards in which then people can exert the control that uh, I discussed about before. Hmm. And you alluded to this sort of question briefly as well, but uh, you know, the question of uh, Ukrainian integration into the EU remains a very long and controversial process if it'll ever go through in the first place. Um, let's apply your concentric circles model to that. How does uh, this concentric circles uh, help us understand the situation of Ukraine? Exactly. So clearly, Ukraine will not become part of the EU at any point in time, I think. Um, but, uh, oh, maybe at the very long, at the end of the very long process, if Russia permits, so to speak. Um, but at the same time, it can instead become part of a much stronger uh, sort of um, alliance with the EU. If it were part of this outer circle of the European common space, it doesn't need to be part of the EU. It could be very strong so formal associations in terms of trading, in terms of customs union, 
um, in terms of regulation and so on. To some extent, Turkey is a good example, is part of the European Customs Union, even if it's not part of the EU, and that clearly creates lots of advantages in terms of tariffs and so on uh, with Turkey. But other countries could be involved in the process, could be the UK itself, clearly, and primarily, or Albania, uh, or Montenegro, or other Balkan uh, countries. So to some extent, if you were to create um, this outer circle, that could help solve the Ukrainian um, situation once and for all. It will not be part of the EU, but it will be strongly associated with the uh, EU. Russia will feel reassured and, and Ukraine would uh, enjoy some, if not most, perhaps not all, but most of the benefits of being part of the European um, space of the European Union. So um, this could be one solution that could be applied and it would, uh, I think, solve lots of problems uh, for, for the future. It just needs a bit of um, open mind by, by the European policymakers, not having a mechanical approach to integration, mm. but, you know, an approach that uh, uh, really uh, looks into, into the needs of people and countries and the international um, relations and the way they are devised, in which clearly this constant integration of countries uh, in the EU and then in NATO and so on is proved um, at some point detrimental for some of the countries involved. So um, you need to rethink the way the European integration process works. Mm. I mean, it seems to me it's very clear that the EU has lots of moving parts. And if you, and you know, countries have a particularly volatile uh, relationship with integration and, and moving, you know, sliding backwards on that same axis. Uh, and I think what your model does is help us understand how much importance should be assigned to different countries and where they place within these concentric circles. So as always, Marilla, very useful to get your insight and thoughts. Thank you very much. Until next time.